There's a place in Chicago where you don't want to go, where the good Lord forget about you, the devil never calls. State's attorney says it's not there. Man said, no, no, no. Down at Holman Avenue, and I ain't told you so. Would take no back talk, put you to the street, pull that patty in the alley, tune your ass right up till your mama wouldn't know you. Friends all turn their back, it's down on home and avenue. And I ain't told you that. Get your chicken fast to anything you ever done. Some things you ain't thought of yet. For months and months, he got a big old pension check. He lives down on Holman Avenue. And I ain't told you that. Cause there's a place in Chicago where you don't want to go. The good love forget about you. The devil never calls. State's attorney says it's not there. Man said no, no, no. Down on Holman Avenue. I told you that. While the police commission says all legit, you do it by the book just to keep you from the bad guys and crooks. Still them bullets fly, still our babies die. I know where you ought to take them crooked cops, politicians where they lie. Take them down to Holman Avenue. And I just told you that. Well, there's a place in Chicago where you don't want to go. The good Lord forget about you. The devil never calls. State's attorney says it's not there. Mayor said no, no, no. But it's down on Holman Avenue. And I just told you so. Down on Avenue. I just told you so. Woo! You come out, there's a ticket awesome. on your car. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I think I'm up next. Yep. Thank you everyone for coming. This is such an amazing event. So great to meet all of you. Uh, if you don't know me, my name is Jesus Estrada. I'm a member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America Chicago chapter and Revolutionary Poets Brigade Chicago. And I wanted to say a few words about fascism to start our gathering. And then I'm going to introduce our moderators. Fascism appears in many forms. Today we see fascism as a police brutally murder people of color like George Floyd and Adam Toledo. We see state-sanctioned fascism as families have been torn apart and children thrown into cages. The fascism we're experiencing in the United States and elsewhere is not a choice of the ruling class, but the failures of an economic system that cannot meet the needs of the American people. Capitalism is failing. And I think we feel this when the deaths of 500,000 people are seen as collateral damage by our government. Behind it all, even more blatant, is the bloody grip of corporate control of our lives. At the same time, there's a rising hope. Shelter for the unhoused, canceling rent, ending evictions, evictions and foreclosures, and taking over vacant homes have become the battle cries across the country. Cries for an end to COVID apartheid. Cries for an end to destruction of the earth. Cries for an end to police brutality are growing louder each day in every part of the country. But the fascism that threatens us cannot be defeated without a vision from the working class, the poor, and those completely marginalized. We need a vision where life necessities are distributed according to need and people can live safely and free from harm. 
a vision where there is abundance for everyone in the world, where there is a thriving, sustainable earth for future generations. Our children, all of us, deserve nothing less. This poetry reading is dedicated for that future. Next, I have the honor of introducing our moderators. Many of you know Lou Rosenbaum, but he is a poet, bookseller, and founding member of the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. And Daniel Brooks is a poet, chief editor of the Unity Anthology, and an educator. I guess it's up to me to start off. Um, I'm going to start by introducing uh, the program is going to happen this way. Each poem, each poet is going to read one poem and we'll have three sets of poetry. Uh, after each set, each of the poets will be asked, and not just the poets that have read, but the poets, all the poets will be asked to respond to three questions that we have. How do you see your work or your art contributing to the fight against fascism? How does the fight inform your work? How is, how is art the soul of revolution? Very important questions for us to consider as we, as we continue our work. Um, my pleasure is in being part of this amazing group of, of writers and poets extraordinary to be here and it's even more extraordinary for me to be able to introduce uh, Jack Hirschman. Jack is an emeritus poet laureate of San Francisco but that's not how I know him. I've known him for more than 30 years and uh, have always been amazed by his work and he's the one that actually inspired this reading by sending us a message from the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco saying uh, <clears throat> that this was going on. So Jack, please take it away. Hi, hi folks. <clears throat> Let me first ask you to reach for a pencil or write something down. April 30th is the deadline of the Revolutionary Poets Brigade of San Francisco's anthology called Building Socialism, that is, Fighting Fascism. Uh, my email address is, is my wife's name. It's Aggie Folk, A-G-G-I-E-F-A-L-K. Aggie Falk or Falk at hotmail.com. You're all welcome to send a poem before December 30th to that April. address. April 30th. April 30th, yes, th next week. Uh, okay, that having been said, I want to tell you I'm going to read a poem. Uh, one of my arcanes, uh, the name of my longer poem, but it's not that long. Uh, it's based upon what you'll hear later from uh, Luis Felipe Sarmento from Lisbon, Portugal, the Red Carnation Movement, which in the 70s actually de defeated fascism in Portugal. I'm going to read an arcane called the Red Carnation Arcane. <clears throat> One, if it could be done in Portugal almost 50 years ago, the Red Carnation can stop the spread of uh, fascism everywhere today, tomorrow. So let's get that huge jail built for the 838 hate groups, clans, and Nazis, skins, and all those who have to learn hate is not 
free speech. And we have to see that they spend time away from the innocence of children they despise, the blacks who they've always terrorized, the Jews they've always lied about, the gays they've mocked. And now that the red carnations have exposed the traitors of the working class, the police, mm -hmm. whose betrayal is rooted and resonating to those very Klansmen and Nazis. But now, oh, no. enlightened no, okay. understanding has the cops jailing Klansmen and Nazis and beginning to deal with neighborhoods as if they were neighbors and didn't wear hoods. And hopefully they begin to think that perhaps they'd had it all wrong defending capitalists and began seeing blacks as their working class brothers and sisters and children in a vivid family, too. Look at that. With all the mongers of fascist hate in the jail where they belong, just look at that beat cop who's admiring Bueller made Dandridge's garden of red carnations in the outer mission. Why, she's even given him her watering can, and he's sprinkling the carnations with water from that sprinkler on the side of which is written American Ku Klux Klan's American Nazis, you're finished with murdering democracy at last. Okay, Luke, pass on. Thank you uh, so much, Jack. Uh, that was great. Uh, it's an honor to have you here and it's an honor to have everyone here. Um, and also thank you to you, Hisu, uh, for the great introduction um, as well. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's truly an honor to be here uh, among so many awesome people, writers, cultural workers, poets, lovers of poetry, and so on. Um, my name is Daniel, and I'll be co-moderating uh, right alongside Lou today. Uh, we're so glad to have everyone here. And um, a big shout out to Jack and everyone that was a part of putting the battery into this event. Um, and we're so glad to, to have everyone here. Um, Lou, do uh do we have Luis with us? Do we do we move on? Sorry, Lou, I muted people out to uh, I uh I just sent the link to Luis in Lisbon. Uh I'm sure he's trying to get in right now. Are you talking about Luis Sarmento? Yes. 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 He's trying to get in. I've just sent him the link. He didn't have it. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Thank you. Okay. He'll, he'll get in at any moment. And uh, if you could please mute out if you're not speaking or performing, that'd be great. I'm trying to keep up with everybody, but... Luis is in, so uh, go ahead, uh, Daniel. Awesome, hello, Luis, Th uh, welcome. Um, next, joining us from, from Portugal, uh, the initiator of the Red Carnation International Poetry Readings, taking place uh, for the past three years in April and commemorating the April 25th Red Carnation Revolution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Luis Felipe Sarmento. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, I need a, a, a second because I, I have a, a problem with the link. 
and um, I demand a, a, a minute to for, uh, read my text. Okay. okay? Absolutely. Uh, take as much time as you need, Luis. Okay. Now. Nah. Okay. Now nah. I'm there. I was saying earlier how wonderful it was to be able to gather poets from all over the world but it doesn't come without like tech issues. <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly that's kind of, <laughs> it's certainly a part of it. Um, I mean, especially considering that because of the advancements in technology, we're able to have this event in the first place mm -hmm. with all of us here. So it's amazing. Sure is. Okay, I do you want to read a, a text or I read my poem? It's up to you, Luis. Absolutely. Okay. I read my uh, my my poem and um, after uh, Van Ber to read in English. Okay? Great. Refugia-te na tua consciência, sem cruzes nem crescentes, sem arames nem muros, sem farpas nem ódios. E logo reconhecerás entre as multidões de andarilhos que perpassam a tua memória os teus ascendentes vindos de longe que te fizeram nascer aqui. De onde vens? A que caverna original pertences? Que línguas navegam nos mares e nos rios do teu sangue? Quantos deuses adoraste, pedindo e esperando que o futuro não fosse este presente? Onde estão as divinas respostas? Refugia-te na tua consciência, sem o medo que os sacerdotes do poder oculto te querem impor, nem a angústia do sonho destruído. Observa a renovação do mar, a regeneração do planeta, a cada ataque inconsciente dos loucos e logo verás o poder das entranhas deste grandioso globo como se fosse uma cabeça que pensa que a possibilidade da derrota é a impossibilidade da vida e faz renascer em todo o esplendor o mapa colorido do que na realidade somos. Refugia-te na tua consciência como anfitrião do futuro e não temas os deuses. Eles que são divinos que se entendam longe desta terra e abra as portas do teu humilde casebre como se fosse um palácio contra a morte e contra a babélica imagem do fim. Thank you. Please, Humberto. Micro, Humberto. I just wanted to say that this was not a, uh, this translation is not mine. It's uh, from a friend in New York, a poet, Scott Edward Anderson, who has recently rediscovered his roots here in the Azores Islands. Um, uh, but he asked me to read it for him, and I do it with pleasure. It's great to be in great company. And um, I have a special um, love for America because I lived in the Los Angeles area after we immigrated from here for 27 years. Then I came back 37 years ago to the University of the Azores and I am now retired. But here's the poem, Take Refuge. Take refuge in your conscious without crosses or crescents, without wires or walls, without barbs or hatreds. And you will soon recognize among the crowds of wanderers that permeate your memory, your ancestors from afar who gave birth to you here. 
Where do you come from? To which original cave do you belong? What languages sail the seas and rivers of your blood? How many gods did you worship? Asking and hoping that the future would not be this present. Where are the divine answers? Take refuge in your conscience without the fear that priests of hidden power want to impose on you, nor the anguish of the destroyed dream. Observe the renewal of the sea, the re regeneration of the planet, every unconscious attack of the madman, and you will soon see the power of the bowels of this magnificent globe, as if it were a head that thinks the possibility of defeat is the impossibility of life and makes it reborn in all its splendor, the colorful map of what we really are. Take refuge in your conscience as host of the future and do not fear the gods who are divine and who understand each other far from this earth and open the doors of your humble hovel as if it were a palace against death and against the chaotic image of the end. By Louise. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Um, Luis, could you say a few words about the or, uh, origin of the Red Carnation movement? Traduz-me aí, Vamberto, que eu não percebi. Ele está a perguntar se tu podes dizer umas palavras sobre a origem da revolução de, de escravos. Queres que eu faça? Okay, I, ah. uh, um, I speak in, in Portuguese, but because my English is very, very, very bad. Uh, I cannot uh, uh, make a, a, a text, but I, 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 I said in, in Portuguese and Vamberto uh, uh, make the, the translation. Excuse me, because my English is, is not good. Um, a revolução, a revolução de, uh, dos escravos em Portugal Uh, foi uma, uma revolução para libertar, sobretudo, a juventude de uma guerra e da prisão. Uh, the uh, origins of the Carnation Revolution in April 25th, 1974, had to do with the liberation of our youth from unjust wars in Africa. And the liberation, uh, he didn't say it, but I'll add it. And also the liberation of the Portuguese people who had been living under a dicta fascist dictatorship for 48 years. Go ahead, Luís. Um, eu estive muito jovem nessa, nessa luta, uh, nessa luta armada contra o regime fascista em Portugal. Uh, com 16 anos fui preso, voltei a ser preso aos 17 anos. E foi com um, emoções descontroladas que ajudei a que aquela manhã fosse um êxito para a liberdade das novas gerações. At the age of 16, I was part of the armed resistance in Portugal and I was arrested by the secret police, obviously. And they let me out and I returned to the fight Uh, at the age of uh, 17. Um, and so I am proud of being part of what started uh, in the military. Uh, I would like to add to Louise, uh, because um, uh, Portugal is not that known uh, in America, that uh, we're very proud of a military that puts an end to an unjust war on three fronts in Africa and liberate the Portuguese people. I'm not sure that I'm correct in this, but it was only the only military coup by the captains in secrecy from their superiors in the military uh, that overthrew a government to establish democracy. And this was very rare uh, in the world. Uh, the carnation was, were distributed as the cannons and the troops 
young man. I was 22 then and living in the Los Angeles area, Orange County, actually one of the most conservative counties in California. Uh, and, and so we're very proud of this. Uh, we're very proud of this because it's very unusual. You know what a military coup means. But in our case, they welcomed, they first asked the people to stay home but they couldn't uh, hope them, uh, hold themselves in the house. And they came out, women kissing the soldiers, the soldiers trying to get them away. They had, they had a government to overthrow. Uh, they had a secret police to control. And I think it's the only revolution that is a, a sign of departure for the troops. It was all organized in secrecy between the captains in the continent and the captains on the war fronts. Uh, they had combined all of this. And the signals were two songs uh, by two revolutionary singers that uh, were obviously not permitted on, um, on Portuguese public radio. So the troops took the radio over, the main radio station in Lisbon over. And of course, the radio uh, jockeys or presenters collaborated with them right away. They first played a song that uh, warned the, all of their colleagues and the rest of the country that uh, the troops were about to leave from a place uh, two hours from Lisbon with military vehicles movement. And then they finally played the song that it's called After the Goodbye. And when After the Goodbye began on the radio, a young captain by the name of Salgueiro Maia left, uh, left their, um, their place and marched to Lisbon. It took them three hours and they figured that they would reach as the sun came up. And you might wonder why the Carnation Revolution because in downtown Lisbon, florists went to work very early. They didn't know anything about this. What they saw was these troops with cannons, with rifles, taking over the streets of Lisbon. And the troops were very sweet to them. So what they, what they began doing was when they understood that liberation was coming after 48 years of oppression, they began putting carnations on their rifles. <laughs> Uh, and even children were on the street. The troops were just trying to get them away so they, they, they could get to the main building where the prime minister uh, was, uh, was hidden. And of course, after they arrested him, then a general took over uh, uh, for the provisional government. I'm sorry, Luís, but it's easy. Vamberto, Vamberto, uh, eu queria deixar aqui uma curiosidade. Ok. Uh, o, meu, o meu julgamento estava marcado para o dia 14 de maio de 1974 e eu já sabia qual era a minha sentença. Ia direito, direito para a guerra na Guiné. Ou seja, era uma condenação à morte. Yeah. Eu tenho muito orgulho de ter participado na última revolução romântica do mundo. E a uh, Luiz is saying he's very proud of having participated in the last romantic revolution in the world uh, as we uh, know it today. He was to be conscripted on that day and he said he had no doubts that as punishment he would be sent to the war front in what would become Guinea-Bissau uh, in which the, the African nationalists were fighting against us. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, the troops, this is not legend, this is really true. When the orders from Lisbon came from a total ceasefire, both sides dumped their rifles, and I think it was in Angola, and they began playing soccer together. Uh, so it is a very, <laughs> it is a very unusual, it was a very unusual liberation. And today, uh, Luis is not seeing this, but I'll add it to it. The renewal of our music, the renewal of our literature is coming right out of Africa or uh, from the Africans that chose to live 
in uh, continental Portugal and some here in the islands. They've made a great contribution to renew our music that had been under censorship for 48 years. They brought new sounds, they brought new uh, poetry, and they are now bringing some of the greatest novels in Portugal. Uh, we are now fighting against those who have forgotten all of these things. We're fighting uh, for the return of socialism in Portugal, democratic socialism. Um, and, uh, uh, and so that's what it is. And uh, COVID, COVID or no COVID, we're going to celebrate it anyway. <laughs> I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you both for your, your contribution here. I think this is tremendous. It gives us a good background and good history for us to, to get on with the program. And I want to, in, uh, want to say that oh, neither Daniel nor I will be actually introducing the poets. We'll be asking the poets to say a few things about themselves. I'm just going to, we're just going to call you up to the mic, as it were. So uh, first on our list, or next on our list, is the Andrea Change. Thanks, Lou. Thank you for me in this event. Um, my name is Andrea Change, <clears throat> and I am she, her, and uh, I am currently the executive director for the Guild Complex and have been uh, a writer of various things, including poetry, for a really long time. Um, I'm not as old as Lou, but I like to think I'm pretty... <laughs> So, um, and I, I also, hi Jen, I want to apologize because when Lou first invited me, I wasn't sure if I would be able to make it. And given the events of the week, I was challenged to write something that I thought might be worthy of this. So I wanted to, um, and, and you'll have to indulge me, read a, a, a story that I wrote, um, and it's short, um, that sort of gives you my first introduction to I, I want to say a police state, but here goes. It's called In 1975. In 1975, the family trip to this year was made. For the weather got too hot and the mosquitoes got too thirsty. Normally, we would stay home with my dad, but there was trouble brewing in my parents' marriage that would come to a head in a few years. Another story, another time. Preparation for the trip was the best part. It was the only time you get to go shopping at the store and pick out whatever snacks you wanted. But the rules were simple. Make it big, make it shareable, make sure you like it and make sure it lasts. You don't want to be the one who picked Fruity Pebbles Rice Krispie Treats that no one likes. There was also chicken fried and sandwiches made for the road. We only stopped for gas and no, you can't have a treat. There was, only, there was also no bottled water then, so airtight containers of Kool-Aid were made, but no sippy cups. If you spilled your drink, you, literally, and help you if you spilled on somebody else. The few kids that came were divided three kids to a car. It was a convoy of Buicks, and my grandmother and her sisters were big into CB radio, and each had one in the car. One kid was always relegated to the front seat in between two adults, which as a kid sounded sweet, but there was always something to do. Hand me the map, pass me my drink, change the station, give me a piece of chicken. No, I don't want a wing, hand me a napkin. It was an eight hour to-do list. The goal at the rest stop was always to talk some other kid into the front seat by telling them how cool it was. The truth was the back seat wasn't much better, but once it got a little quiet, I could read. I would pack at least two to three books, but the mentality for my family was, what you need books for, you're gonna be outside anyway. Not me. I loved my books and would find a spot to read no matter what or where. The trip was uneventful until we got close and there was a storm. By the time we got to the road to Grandma Hattie's house, it was so thick with Arkansas mud, the cars could barely get through. So we had to walk a mile in the dark, in mud the middle of the night. Holly Grove, Arkansas was the family homestead where my great grandmother Hattie Cokes resided in a small two bedroom house on a huge plot of land. This tiny house raised 11 children. 
And since there was indoor plumbing, it was considered modern by some standards. I don't know how many, but we all huddled in. The married folks got the second bedroom. My grandmother left with my grandma Hattie in her bed. There were two let out couches. And if you were lucky, you slept on top. But if you were a kid, you slept underneath. Yes, underneath the couch. It was like camping, my cousin said, except the little spike metal parts never snagged your braids or pulled at your t-shirt at night. The next day, Mama Hattie was in the kitchen and made hot biscuits. She grabbed some eggs from the chickens in back and finished off breakfast for all of us. If you didn't get enough, then you weren't getting it fast enough. After breakfast, about five of us, boy and girls, were tossed brown well water. I was swatted once on the butt for complaining, like I knew the water was supposed to be that color. We were cleaned and clothed and sent outside. Outside, there was nothing but an old trailer rumored to be full of spiders, four old dogs, one with a snake bite, and a bunch of chickens. Mean chickens who did not appreciate our childish invasion of their space. I was about to find a quiet spot for reading when my mom called me to come with. They had to go to town with all the clothes since we came in dirty and sweaty the night before. I was excited. Great, a town. We loaded laundry and headed to town. I dreamed of bustling streets, stores, buses, and people. What I found was a sleepy two-sided street divided by tracks for the Amtrak train. <sighs> Sigh. This was the same kind of overhyped mess that got me in the front seat. Fooled again. Somehow we had a ton of clothes, more than the coins we brought, so I was sent to get change. I stood in front of the laundromat in this sleepy town looking for where I could go to get change. There was no signage. Every building looked the same. I had gone to the store next door, but they said they didn't have change. The store didn't have change. But I grew up in the city, so I knew to do what I was taught in school. I grew up with Officer Friendly. I have got the coloring book to prove it. So when I spied a police officer, I politely sauntered over in my best nine-year-old white person voice, excuse me, sir, can you help me find change, please? Before he could respond, I heard voices yelling my name, screaming and waving for me to come back. I politely said, thank you, and ran off. When I got to my mom, the yelling didn't stop. I was being scolded harshly. I tried to explain my difficulties about finding change to no avail. Sit down and don't move. Child ain't got the good sense the Lord gave her. I thought you said she was smart. You better be glad I don't beat your ass right here. I sat bewildered, not understanding. For the rest of the trip, I was a fool to my family and the recipient of numerous mumbles, side-eyed glances, and ridicule from my cousins. My books were my solace for the rest of the time. And Mama Hattie say, she don't know no better, and gave me a hug before we left. You see, this story is a non-story about a nothing thing that was something that could have happened. It would be several years before I realized that I had put myself in harm's way by talking with that policeman, a white policeman in the South. And I was young, naive and black. The boogiest of boogeyman nightmare visions could come to mind, disappeared, beaten, raped, even murdered. My family knew. The calling of my name, their screams were pleas to hire angels to maintain my ignorance my innocence. It didn't take long into my teens before I realized every officer ain't friendly. As a child, I had lived in the safety of a large family's love, never encountering those things that might harm me. I had not the benefit of this education at the age of nine. But you see, we don't forget. Then, it had only been 10 years prior they saw black bodies being beaten on television during that fateful march on Bloody Sunday. A 14-year-old, Emmett Till, had only been brutally killed 20 years before over a rumored whistle. Our bodies are full of generational trauma. We remember and feel every swing of the strange fruit. I have dreamt of being shot in my sleep 
of a jog turned into a run, run for your life. Sometimes I worry if this generation is too far removed from those traumas. I see today they are not, but it is likely more that there is so much trauma, it has made them reckless. And like Toussaint Louverture, John Brown, and Nat Turner, they are ready, ready, ready for revolution. Thanks. Oh. Wow. I can't think of a better way to start off this uh, this program. Thank you, Andrea. Woo. Well, um, let's go on to, I don't know what to say, but thank you again. Let's go on to Matt Cedillo. Uh, the next poem I'm gonna do is from uh, this book here, Mona Needs a Breath. So. Thank you, Lou, for inviting me. Thank you, uh, Jesus, as well. And it's so good to see uh, Jack and Sarah and some uh, some other friends that I haven't seen in a while. Some are born in summer homes and palatial groves with pain. As long as they don't unfold from the pages of secret gardens, the red friend grows, but not I. See, I come from the stock of star-eyed astronauts who meet the night sky, big dreams and wide eyes, always running down the devil's highway through occupied America. The blue back house on Mango Street. One of the books he didn't want us to read. There's a handball off the back wall of a panaderia born east the river post Mendez versus Westminster, one generation with the red lines and diplomas that were signed with those dreams. And that skin need not apply. See, I come from struggle. And if my story offends you, because you made the mistake of seeking your reflection in my support to see this, what's going to be about you? Because some are born in the common core. Respected faces grace the pages of doctrines to discover an age to be explored. World, world hardships crashed against new shores, New England, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, for others pushed off to island, Aslan, do not call this brown skin immigrant. Child of the sun, son of the conquest, Mexicano blood, running through the veins east side of Los Angeles, do not tell him what native tongue and song will best be sung, do not tell me who I am. Because I was rich just like you. Miseducated in some of those very same schools off lessons and legends of honest Indians and Christian pilgrims and a nation of immigrants all united in freedom that isn't until they pulled aside my white friend, pointed directly at me and said, Scott, I judge you by the company you keep and you spend your time with this. And that's Samuel Stories, 1846. Adventure Uncle Sam, stick up Manny Wetback. Show me your papers now, give me your labor, the melting pot. Was never made for the hands to clean it. The American dream has always come at the expense of those who tucked it in. You don't know that. So you don't teach it. Could write you a book, but you won't read it. So you know this is about you. In 1492, and the Treaty of Guadalupe and California missions and Arizona schools, and these racists that try to race us as these are kids in cities that bear our names. But you can learn some today from Ferdinand to Minuteman, from Arpaio to Alamo, from Boba Wood to Sawakin, the Indian as it lives in me from May 8, 1743, and try to bury us. They didn't know we were seeds. Can they have minds? Lindo strike the plan to Allah, Rizapada, Joaquin Rieta, that's not elite, that's Brown Beresi, Zapatista, that's Richard Nixon, third Napoleon, from Peckinpah to Houston, from Lone Star Republic to Christopher Columbus, all the way down to Donald fucking Trump. We didn't cross the borders. The borders crossed us. Who you calling immigrant? Pilgrim. All right. All right. You can always count on Matt's video. Wow. Um, let's uh, hear from Diana Zwinnick. Hello. Oh, wow. Um, first of all, I want to say it's it's such an honor to be on a, a program with so many amazing poets like this and to follow Matt is is a wonderful thing. Um, I guess where I want to start, I have to give a little bit of background. In 2016, um, I was part of a number of people who went to Standing Rock with the uh, people for the People's Tribune to write about Standing Rock. And 
it, we weren't there for many days, but we were there long enough for me to really understand, have a whole new visceral human understanding of what fascism really looks like from the time that we were there. And uh, it changed my writing. I wrote so many poems about fascism just in trying to describe the whole experience there. And I also changed my trajectory kind of as a journalist because one of the things I wrote about for the People's Tribune was the fact that um, a particular farmer on the land, unceded land near the Standing Rock Reservation happened to um, have a prairie dog problem, I guess. And he laid down 80,000 pounds of Rosal prairie dog poison on his land, on his acreage there. And you got to understand about this poison that what you do is you take like a cup of it and you dump it in a prairie dog hole. That's how you use it. You don't lay, lay down so many pounds. And what it ended up doing and the way they found out that he had done this was um, a buff some buffalo started dying. And then the uh, eagles that were eating the buffalo, the buffalo died because they ate the grass. The eagles started dying because they ate the buffalo and it became clear that this really egregious poisoning had happened. And this is part of my poem, so this is why I'm, why I'm telling you about it. And the other thing that features in my poem, and I'm gonna hold him up here so that you can see him, there's the statue that stands in Sacred Stone Camp and he's called Not Afraid to Look. And he looks over the Missouri River, he looks over, um, the, uh, the, the bridge, the backwater bridge, he looks over where all of the water protectors had been maced and sprayed with water and on that fateful, fateful night in November. And so I guess that's where I'm gonna start with this. The poem's called Not Afraid to Look. I call him the watcher. His real name, Not Afraid to Look. He sits on a hill looking over the Missouri River in Cannonball, North Dakota, facing the hills, the sacred land, the bridge, the sky, not afraid to look. He has seen more than 350 nations come together, the most since the day that Custer died. He has seen a camp of seven fires grow, subside, and grow again, not afraid to look, has seen water cannons trained on unarmed people, pepper spray dowsing unarmed people, not afraid to look, bears witness to secrets, knows the answer to questions like, how did 40,000 pounds of Rosal prairie dog poison get deposited on the surface of 80 acres of ground on unseated land instead of inside prairie dog burrows? Why 40,000 pounds when only 500 pounds would have sufficed? What are those planes really doing in the middle of the night? What falls from the sky? Why are the water protectors coughing? Coughing until they bleed, can't stop coughing. Why do healthy people have strokes, heart attacks, die when they return to their homes after protecting the water? Why did LaDonna Brave Bull Allard pass away from brain cancer this past month? not afraid to look, knows why their hearts are breaking or if they have been broken without their knowledge or consent. Not afraid to look has seen the reason why the tribal council mandated that the water protectors go home, why it asked the sheriff and the national guard to help remove them if necessary. Not afraid to look does not even blink to think of what that would mean when the paramilitary tries out more new equipment. Not afraid to look, watch the buffalo die. Watch the eagles die. Watch the protectors bleed from non-lethal impacts, from coughs that will not relent. Watch Red Fawn risk her life shoveling protectors from the front lines to the medics and back again. Saw her arrested days later after shooting at police while a crowd of police held her to the ground and tased, not afraid to look, believes his eyes. 
wants us to change our names to not afraid to see. Thank you. That, uh, that poem actually reminds me of a Portuguese novel by uh, um, Saramago called Seeing, which uh, uh, kind of refers to something like that under, under fascism. Thank you, Diana, a marvelous contribution. Uh, next up is Vincent Romero. Am I unmuted? You are. My name is Vincent Romero. I'm from the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico. I reside here in uh, Chicago. I've been here for a number of years. Uh, my poem is a little bit edgy, but it's, uh, I think it's pertinent. It's called The Finance Debater. The finance debater came to us selling his gold, called on those so young and so bold. He softly promised not to dividend in our wallets, though his call is as juicy and wet as the wet dream in our wallets. The rich and impotent clamored about to hear porno dollars pour from his mouth. He'll stroke all their bank accounts and swallow large bilked amounts then be gone like a blind date from a roadhouse in the South. Like romanceturbation, it's all a creation, seeking media's sleek ointment for the wealth lover's appointment. And like white approval, he needs brown skinned removal and the fat cat coins squeezed out of the loins of the pimped out poor man's he holds by the groins. But he likes it that way when laws he can sway and breaks rules to pad his brothel and harem. An orange statue he'll erect, hard and veiny perfect. As president he becomes and loots the horde country neglect. Thank you. Wow. Edgy is what we need, right? I All think right. so. I would say so. Um, next, I would like to turn to uh, today's birthday woman, Karen <laughs> Harvey Turner. <laughs> Thank, <Happy birthday>. you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here today. Uh, and this is such amazing poetry, such uh, powerful words. Um, so thank you. Um, and this is what I have to share. Tell me where hope is found and I will take my child's hand and we will walk across continents to that place. I will swim rivers with my child riding my shoulders. I will hold them to my heart and pray when soldiers shoot. We will speak old and new stories together in our language as we travel in darkness. We may rest when we find a welcoming fire. And though we rest, we never stop resisting for our survival is Jack. resisting. Put a note in the chair. So we go forward. So you beat upon us with hate, with sticks and guns and words and laws and treaties. We will continue. Wouldn't you do this too, to find hope for you and your children? Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, absolutely great stuff. It uh, really speaks to why we're here and um, absolutely. DB, uh, did you wanna chime in? Yeah, uh, uh, I'm. Uh, I, I can't stay, but um, Lou had to take a bathroom break, <laughs> so uh, he asked me to introduce the next speaker, which is Michelle. All right. Thanks, Diane. 
Hey, all can you hear me? Good? Cool. So, such an honor to be here with all of you today. So much talent. Thank you for inviting me. I am Michelle Salteris. I'm a first generation Greek American slam poet from Chicago, Illinois, but right now I am in Aurora, Colorado. Um, the anti fascist poem that I've chosen to share today because we all have more than one, right? <laughs> um, is personal, I guess. It's personal to my family and personal to my people. So a little background on uh, the story, I guess, is on October 28th, 1940, the Italian dictator Mussolini gave Greece an ultimatum that we could give up our harbors and let them occupy Greece, or we could go to war. And our prime minister, Ionis Metaxas, replied with, then it is war. And the message spread all through Greece, ohi, which means no, and everyone kind of expected Greece to lose, but they actually beat the Italians so bad that they needed to call the Nazis for backup, which threw off their plans and kind of gave the allies hope again. So I wrote this poem five days before Trump was elected when he quoted Mussolini and said that it didn't matter who said it because it was a good quote. October 28, 1940, Greece says, Ohi, no. To the Italian dictator stationing soldiers on their land, knowing they probably can't fight off the consequences of their choice. 1940, my grandmother is five. She is walking to school with people hanging from the trees. 1940, there are people in line for a loaf of bread they know will not feed their family for the week. 1940, Greek soldiers line up to fight a war they know they are not big enough to win. 1940, Churchill says Greeks do not fight like heroes. Heroes fight like Greeks. 1941, America joins war for financial gain. 1941, America fights in a war they will never actually see. 1941, American president, American people halfway across the world from it says yes and never cares what it looks like. 1941, America says yes. Yes, atom bomb. Yes, fighter jets. Yes, big market for big gain. 1941, America will never see 1941 Greece. 2016, America will never Google search 1941 Greece. Still don't see the wars they fight. Still can't find the right reasons. 2016, America, I am listening to him speak. And sometimes he almost quotes him. Sometimes he looks like him. They call him Donald and I call him 1930 Mussolini gaining friends and I watch America say yes again. 1940s, the Archbishop of Greece says we must stand with our Jewish brothers. 2016, and I'll be damned if I do not stand with my Muslim ones. This is for an America that puts a man like this on a pedestal. This is for an America that sees no problem in a man who wants to hand out nuclear weapons like candy on Halloween and a man who hates based on religion, based on sexuality, gender, race. This is for an America that doesn't know how to fight like heroes, let alone Greeks. This is for the Americans who fight like Trumans or Jacksons or Davises. This is for the Americans who flaunt the Confederate flag, who wanna make America great again, like there's a time they could go back to. This is for America like a wake up call, like the second alarm you set just in case you slept through the first one. This is before you have religion ID cards. This is before people are hanging in your, your trees. This is before you forget to say no, to say no, say no. Thank you. Bravo. myself here. There we go. Uh, we're going to do this very quickly because we're a little bit behind time. So we're just going to have time for a, a few people to say a few things about what they think in terms of um, the questions. And I'm just going to repeat them that, uh, that we were thinking about is, first of all, how do you see your work, your art, contributing to the fight against fascism? And I just want to ask Anybody who wants to say something about that, just unmute yourself and and uh, jump in. Jack, go ahead. Yeah, if I may, uh, 
is by way of something I've written vis-a-vis -vis the World Poetry Movement, which is really sponsoring this event. Uh, was born in uh, Medellin, Colombia, when a group of poets from different countries got together to do uh, to do what? Uh, to change the world. We don't believe that a poem does nothing. In fact, many, if not all of us, believe at heart that everyone is a poet. And if such a thought was understood and then actualized, the children of the world wouldn't need a communist revolution because it already would have been realized. Of course, the World Poetry Movement hasn't succeeded in such an aim, though we've organized and helped others, others organize hundreds of poetry readings in this decade and published our online poetry planetariat anthology for all the world to see. Over the, over the same decade, we've seen a rise of fascism globally. But the World Poetry Movement has been fortunate to have Lisbon's Luis Philippe Sarmento, who's not only brought memory of the Red the Carnation Movement of Portugal that defeated fascism in the 70s, but who's inspired the, the World Poetry Movement to organize Red Carnation poetry readings all over the world this April. Cool. Anybody else want to say something? So poetry is a weapon against fascism because it is the key to what it means to exist in every human being. I'll go real quick and think about it from a different perspective. I teach uh, poetry to my creative writing students and my community college students. And a lot of them come from, you know, um, historically underserved communities. And But I think what poetry does is elevate ideas in such a way that it connects with them at a deep human level in a way that no assignment does. We I teach Overthrowing Capitalism, volume five. And every poem that they analyze, it's just, it's just gorgeous, right? Um, and I, I like to think of something Adam Gottlieb said recently, and that is poetry is the highest form of communication. I think he's right about that. You know, um, the unfortunate thing that in the US poets are so underappreciated, it doesn't carry the same kind of clout that it does in other countries, but it should, you know? Um, but I, I think for me as an educator, the, the revolutionary poetry or anti-fascist poetry is key, you know? Andrea, since you have to leave uh, pretty soon, I thought I'd, I'd put you on the spot and see what you think. And then we'll go on from there into the next set. Thanks, Lou. Um, and I appreciate it. Sure, but I have a, another appointment with you. Um, but thanks everybody for including me. Um, and especially in this first round, I, um, you all were amazing. I think poetry, even in its feeling, no matter what the subject matter is, today it just happens to be fascism, but it is a pathway to empathy. The same thing that uh, Jesus uh, said uh, is that it gives us a, a entryway to understanding someone else's plight. Um, it is one of the simpler forms of the literary arts, although it can be complex, obviously, but um, one line of a poem or one line of stanza from a poem gives us access to someone else's feeling, someone else's story, someone else's understanding in a way that no other work can. And um, it's done with such a touch um, because it's short that the emotion that it's supposed to uh, impart is always there, whether it's full of fire like Matt's poem or or history like Michelle's poem, it, it those things that we we want the audience to gain, we have to do it in such a, a short time frame with a poem that it's as impactful to use a as a bullet. Um, when 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 it's when it's done right and it's aimed in the right manner, the the whole thing opens us up. So um, that's that's the goal. Whenever I write a piece. Um, and um, 
is to sort of find the understanding. And it's the same thing when I read a poem, is to try to gather understanding, to try to put myself in someone else's shoes. So um, peace and gratitude to everybody and uh, continue with uh, solidarity and revolution. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Daniel to go on to the next set. Daniel, would you uh, take us into the second group of poets? Um, absolutely, Lou. Uh, much appreciation uh, to all the poets and the, and the cultural workers that have shared their work today. Um, it's no small feat. And um, I think that one thing uh, that many people that are not writers kind of misunderstand about writing is that it's not just a hobby, um, that it is like very hard work and, and labor. Um, and so in that regard, a lot of writers are workers, um, many in which are a part of the working class. Um, and it's kind of our duty, you know, to convey that um, to readers and people in general. And there's a role that poets and, and cultural workers play in the movement and for the, and for the fight for basic needs. And in a lot of ways, poets are propagandists and, um, and play a role in combating these forces and institutions of power that we've been discussing, discussing today. So uh, we win readers over to the side of humanity. That's what poets do. Um, so moving on to our second round um, of poets here today, uh, we wanna start with uh, Jennifer Carmen. Um, Jennifer, if you could just follow the same kind of format, introduce yourself, maybe a little bit about the piece that you would like to read. Thank you so much. Can you guys hear me okay today? Great. Yeah. Uh, what a true honor and a way to make Zoom into a radical community space. It's an inspiring thing versus like Zoom. I know, Hazy, what we're teaching at City College is not just our workspace, right? But it really is something I can carry with me all week. So thanks. Um, I teach at Truman College. Uh, I've been there for 20 years. I work with immigrants and refugees, uh, many who are undocumented in the adult education program. I use creative writing to do literacy work. And I know a lot of the wonderful writers here through the Red Rover series, reading and performance series that I curate here in Chicago. Um, and one of our annual events has been a Poets for Change event. Uh, I am going to read a collaborative poem. I think uh, through doing collaborative work is one of the ways we can fight fascism. We can talk about it more, but sharing resources that also can include the page, uh, the physical space of a reading series, for example, or a performance. Um, this is a piece I wrote with Bernadette Mayer. I'll, I'll put some links in the chat later to give a shout out to her. And, some of the other things that are going on. Um, I, I want to do a dedication um, to George Floyd's family and to um, Adam Toledo's family here in Chicago. Um, and I just want to do a shout out to white allyship to say that um, as a white ally, I am doing the work that I think um, we all need to be doing. And I wouldn't call this uh, justice served. This is accountability. Um, and I'm really grateful to be able to share in my communities with accountability and thanks to those who are doing um, the emotional and physical labor and creating spaces to support. Um, so shout out to everyone who's involved in these movements. It's, it's really an important time doing the work that I can do. Uh, this poem, Bernadette, and I feel that it's maybe one of the first poems um, in uh, American poetry that has a footnote about the labia. So uh, shout out to all the ladies as well. I don't mind feeling like an idiot. That posy has poise, that opioid is egotistic, that refrigerator is idiotic, that that isn't there. On earth, those hominoids stink. How did that idiotic, egotistic, stinky guy get elected the asshole of the USA without any labia? Things I wish I knew. Everything about plants, which ones can fly, where is my flying carpet? That book that says the world doesn't exist is missing. That doppelganger of mine came to the door as a Jehovah's Witness. That way birds talk to each other, how the efforts of a life hang together and why they have led to expectations of a definite form. Things I wish I knew, the grammar of labia, the solidarity of waiting which seeds remain dormant. 
that book is missing, the money is missing, our fortune is missing, as is the doppelganger and the dipshit leader of our land, which is not a refrigerator. She came to the dishwasher and gave us a pamphlet about blueberries. The blueberries glistened so they would think they were made by a higher glistening power, but it was only glistening with the blood of the very same higher power, which resembled a giant tick disseminating diseases that made you nasty to your neighbors and buried with all your money so your sisters and brothers can't have it. So please, can I have some more porridge? Sure, the stars at night are big and bright as if their form knew those climate change deniers in those spaceships where things can be seen reflecting the light of that poised higher power. There really is no way of proving the existence of while domain remains yours or mine, but of course it belongs to those birds. Things I wish I knew, the solution to love and loss, the ways to exist outside of language, the slave who is not a slave. Abbott and Costello write a poem. Who's on first? Poets in pajamas on porches imagine a script in which letters were used to stand for sound. A helpless person is a state of potential. If a bird walks in a field and no one is watching, does it exist? Please, can I have some more pleasure? Or please, can I have some more desire? Or please, can I have some more power? A dancing poise reaches for the deer tick like an opioid on paper money. If you put ticks on cash, fields of wiggly artifacts appeared wrapped in blue jeans and beneath them is the grilled peach of the universe. It never begins, never ends, so watch out. A dancing horse on a string, a parasite on a parasite, a theory that questions itself, is money money or is it money money? or work hard, or hardly working, or hard work. Point of information, Plato owned slaves and hated women. The inflated ego to the tyrant is a curse to himself and his world, so watch out. Now in the poem, we have a huge list of questions. Here it goes. Who is Millicent? Why did the chicken cross the road? Why the fuck does the US have an electoral college? Where are the missing socks? Does the electoral college in any way make it easier to have a monarchy, a totalitarian dictatorship? When is the best time for a revolution? Is there another thistle plant like the one by the front porch yet? How will capitalism disappear? Are the thistle plants taking over? Are they edible? Who decided to make a human into a slave? Why is the sky white? What amount of money is enough? What's the best way to get rid of deer ticks? Why are the rich still in control? If a bird walks in a field, does it mean there's a flying theater? What is the best time for an orgasm? If I buy cheese in my dreams, can I eat it later? Who screamed the loudest? Is $84 enough to buy a house with a swimming pool? Where are the best drugs? What is the best French food? Where is the greenest place on earth? Have you ever had a popover? Made one? When does war end? Would you ever miss the target? Why won't you listen? What's the target? Are you kidding? We see that in the animal world, progressive development and mutual aid go hand in hand. Can thought create action? Can horses dance? Can you grill the universe? Is work hard? If it's hard, is it work? Does that mean you get paid? Are there more white flowers than white butterflies? Hand in hand go aid, mutual and development, progressive world, animal, the in that see we. Is it raining there? Is it raining men? Is it raining penises? Are there any body parts that you would like to fall from the sky? Is it raining money? Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer, uh, for that beautiful piece, um, really showing how poetry can really bring these objective conditions to life. Um, you know, with such clarity. Um, next, uh, we're gonna call on you, Hesu, 
um, to share your piece. Thank you. Thank you, comrade. And so good to see everybody. And by the way, I, I'm trying hard not to laugh and fall out of my chair, but these poems have been amazing, really, really beautiful. Um, I'm not going to have a long intro, but I will say that I also teach Mesodios mowing leaves of grass. And I, I think I may have borrowed one of your lines. So <laughs> I'm sorry about that. This piece is called uh, Nopales, and I dedicate it to the families that have been torn apart and continue to be torn apart. And it's also reminiscent of San Juan de Rio Colora, um, Sonora, which I don't really talk about in here, but it was uh, the village where my, my parents grew up, Nopales. Don't eat with steel fork, eat with fingers, timeless in my ease, padded out with each heartbeat by your madre and abuelas, your soul weaved in saliva, one trozo at a time. Don't drink Coke, drink yerba buena y café con leche, café ground in el metate by your tios and padrinas, your tongue soaked in justice, one inhalation at a time. Don't dream of tomorrow with gold monedas and dollars as your path. Dream of el ranchito y los aztecas. Dream of running through dusty calles filled with loud aspirations, your eyes looking forward as a better world. Don't cry tristeza over los fascistas y puta migra when they come breaking through your front door like perros in heat, tearing up the kitchen, crushing your jarros with agua dulce, using the bolillos to crack your teeth, wrapping your tongue around your neck in an age of noose, punching your eyes into a black blur, wrenching your heart out with their laws as your children are ripped away in the miscarriage of humanity. Don't cry tristeza over los fascistas y puta migra. You are the Nepal dream they fear so much. Let them tremble. Thank you so much, comrade. I, I love that poem. And I think, uh, you know, what continues to happen at the border is certainly a form of warfare and one of the most obvious manifestations of, of fascism here in America. Um, so thank you so much for, uh, for that, for the, for the imagery. Um, again, I love that poem. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next poet. I'm gonna call on you, Eric. Uh, Eric Allen Yankee, same type of format. Go ahead and do your thing, man. Hello, can you all hear me? Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I had COVID last year in March of 2020. And so I wrote a whole book of poetry. And this is uh, one of the poems I wrote that that time when I had 104 degree fevers. America town. America means you die when they tell you to. When your body wears out its welcome and your fingers are broken under the weight of a toilet brush or maybe a computer keyboard or a garbage truck or anything else that serves capitalism. It matters not what, only that you die when they tell you to. America means heroin is sometimes your only hope, and sometimes you have to take that last hit knowing your breath will go with it because your wallet and stomach are empty, and it's better to be dead than broken in America town. America is where a rape apologist is given the Medal of Freedom, and a rapist can be the president who gave him the damn medal. America is stained with shit and blood that have been present at every American birth. And unless someone decides you are more worthy than the rest of us, you will never dig your way out of all that shit. You know it's true, but you still vote for the men who want you to die when you are told. I heard the story of a girl who went to a party and never woke up. Ever since then, I felt like that girl was America and we have never been awake. The world ended a long time ago, but you've been blinded by the white fallout dust clinging to your eyes, and you never saw the bombs fall. In America town, the bombs always fall somewhere browner. They are never in your sky, 
but a rich man has convinced you that those bombs were musical instruments and voices singing of necessary death and the ashen children that accompany it. America Town means never, never, never having to say you're sorry that you forgot history. There was no history for you to forget because you never read the book. You die when they tell you to, and it may not be your turn yet, but as you watch little fingers reaching out of metal cages, you should remember that your time will come too. Maybe when your lungs are bloody and you've done your part to serve our murdering lords, you too can be granted the Medal of Freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. at such a powerful piece there. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move to another poet, uh, Jerry, if you would step up next and uh, read your, the piece that you have for us today. Jerry, you're on mute. He's in Ireland. Jerry, Jerry Pendergast. Um, Jerry, he was just chatting yeah. earlier. Maybe he dropped. Oh, there he is. And he's there. He's, he's just, he is on mute. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. Hang on just a second here. Let's see. Oh, he's unmuting now. Great. Jerry, go ahead. But oh, we still can't hear you. I think go. Uh, I think we should go ahead. Okay. Um, Jerry, we can always come back to you um, at a better time. Um, Lou, do we have uh, Kathy Powers with us today? I didn't mean yes, to skip over her. Just came okay. Out. Yes, Kathy, I'm, I'm so sorry for skipping over you if I did. Uh, Kathy, we can move to you. Um, glad that you're here and thank you for being with us. Kathy needs to unmute. Kathy, come on. There we I go. Got it. There got we go. It. I got it. I hate my phone. I'm Kathy Powers. I'm 70 years old this year, this March. And I've lived 54 years with, with the mindset of not wanting to be alive. And what's kept me alive are people, not organizations, not therapy. People are my therapy. I got to become an activist when I was about 50, when they closed my mental health centers. And mostly now I write, write about uh, the government taking our money, building barriers, taking away our safety nets. And I post them on Facebook and I send them to the politicians. I don't know if they read them or not, I hope they do. So I have one for you. They closed, they closed our human services office in Uptown and we weren't happy about that. No service here. Where will we go to get our food stamps? Where will we go? Follow the rules. Where can we go to? Where is the person? Who tells us if we live or die? When did this happen? We got no notice. Why did this happen? We need some answers. 
Is there an answer in our new chaos that tells us if we live or die? Where do we go to? How will we get there? We have no bus fare. How can we go? Pushed to the edge of Chicago's west side, six miles across the city, where does the truth lie? How can we live? How will we die? Tell us why. Tell us where. Tell us how. Tell us why. Tell us why. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much. Um, Jerry, I saw you pop in there in the chat. Uh, Jerry, are you, are you ready to go and good to go to, to present your poem? And I guess keep going until his song comes on because I am seeing him chat, but and I message him privately. So, okay. Um, and one thing I did want to check is is Tony with us here today? I don't want to skip anybody over. Okay, Jerry, I I, I saw your message there. Um, we can move uh, on to the questions uh, that we had here. Um, the second question is kind of similar to the first one. Uh, how does the fight for fascism or really just the fight for basic needs, how does that inform your work? Um, so maybe we can present that to the poets that just uh, performed first um, and then uh, we can move on from there. Daniel, can you repeat the question again? I was chatty, sorry. Uh, how does the fight for uh, against fascism or the fight for basic needs inform uh, your work? You want to go first, Hazer? I think I'm going to pass because I accidentally spoke in the first segment, but other people can go. Daniel, is someone else waiting? Um, no, Jennifer, if you want to take a crack at it, go ahead. Take a crack at it is how it feels because that's, <laughs> that's a real big question. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I think um, maybe from my, you got a sense of the poetry that again was a collaborative piece with Bernadette Mayer, so I can't take 100% credit, that, that's a 50-50, but that's just to say that um, I'm interested in the idea of experimenting with ideas, but I think um, staying grounded in revolutionary movements makes me also think about, I don't think accessibility is the best word here, but like if we're going to be really working closely again as far as allyship with working people how do we get our ideas across what kind of um choices and language are we using and i think you can see from that piece sometimes i'm also trying to use humor um as a way to cut through and maybe the space of um imagination as possibility sometimes going into the surreal a little bit seems to me um one of the most powerful places that i can take take my writing um, and then the last thing I can say, Daniel, then to pass it on to someone else is to stay grounded in my everyday experiences in Chicago. Um, like Hezu, again, I'm working with a lot of city college students who are, who are underserved in the city of Chicago. Uh, I've lived in the Humble Park neighborhood for 20 years, uh, being a community activist to support um, the community that was already here when I moved in and started a, started a housing co-op. Um, and maybe the last thing to say, just as far as being a Chicago curator and organizer, it means, um, I know I had to leave, but like doing outreach with groups like the Guild, uh, doing outreach with people like Lou, um, literally, you know, as many voices in the room, as many backgrounds in the room. Um, and I think as this group of poets you guys have assembled today, intergenerational feels really important, right? Acknowledging the real young activists who've been doing the work in the past year, but acknowledging people, a lot of them who are here today who have decades and decades of experience. So Daniel, maybe that's my best way to try to approach that. It's a great question. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, you really did bring some clarity there and, and humor does really help to kind of cut through the steel there. 
Um, because when people hear the F word, you know, when they hear fascism, it really freaks them out. They're like, whoa, you know, this isn't Nazi Germany, right? Um, but as we all know, um, kind of the origins of fascism and, and what we know it to be is, is very much here in America. Um, the, the origins are very much here and it's all around us. So um, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, was, was there anybody else that wanted um, to take a crack as well at that question? Uh, sure. You know, how does our, yeah, go ahead. I just will briefly, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean to over talk, but I think in, especially in the last, I would say six or seven years, there hasn't been a poem I haven't written that hasn't dealt with an objective demand, like this question of what do people deserve, right? And fascism um, too. And, um, but lately I think my work has focused a lot on vision, on what's possible because yeah, people need to be introduced to new ideas. They need to understand the complexities of capitalism and how it's fucking with people's lives. And, but I think they need to see what, 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 what else, what does the future hold, you know? Um, and so that's another way I think of, of fighting, you know, these, these systems of oppression, right? Because it, it is possible to have everybody in the world, but it is possible to have everybody housed if the priorities were right, you know what I mean? Um, but uh, I think that that's also been something important um, to, to fight not just fascism, but capitalism and racism and, you know, what have you. So I want to hear from Eric, though, because he's got these amazing anthologies against fascism. I don't know if he can say something about that. <laughs> Eric, where'd you go? <laughs> he's on mute. Oh. I still hit, remember his poem about scooping the litter box. <laughs> Hello. There he is. Hello. There, there go. he is. So I told you I've never gotten used to Zoom, like can never get used to it for whatever. Um, you know, I used to write poems about squirrels and birds and, you know, trees like everybody else. <laughs> When they first start, you know, we're like, yeah, I'm going to write about that. But then, uh, you know, I looked at the world around me. It was, you know, around the time of uh, Ferguson. Um, so I had to say something, you know, I felt like I had to start saying something about everything that's been going on, you know, since the founding of America. But so I've had plenty to write about. That's how it informs my work um you know the the way i see it is that um the artists are the ones who are often the first times the first ones to point something out and to get people thinking about it to get people thinking about what's wrong with the world um that's kind of our our job i think to make sure people are reminded of it if they've forgotten it. You know, if, if my words or somebody's words can, uh, can get someone to remember that they need to be fighting against fascism rather than for fascism. Here in America, we have so many people who are, you know, dying for fascism. It, it seems dying to love fascism. You know, they're like ready to, to, to run to it and embrace it. And they, they have, and they will continue to do it. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Can I say something, Daniel? Absolutely. Just, uh, just one very quick thing, I think. And that is that, um, that I agree with uh, what Hesse said that uh, you know, pretty much everything I write is in some way connected to some objective battle that's going on, something that's going on that informs my work, so to speak. Uh, it could be somebody, uh, it, it was, as a matter of fact, I was sitting at a poetry reading at a Royal uh, Coffee uh, a number of years back and oh. a cop drove up um, behind uh, somebody who was and pulled him over, and somebody was riding a bicycle uh, stopped to video it. Now, this is somebody like this woman in, in uh, 
in Minneapolis who videoed the George Floyd uh, um, killing or the person who videoed the Laquan McDonald killing. She stopped to do that. And that was a seminal moment to write about. And so, you know, things like that are really, really important to kind of lift up as not, uh, not a, you know, you can take a vision of the future out of that and, and, and look at what technology can do, but you can also look at what, what is going on around you in terms of the police state. Um, I, I think the, and there are various ways of doing it. You don't have to do it directly and all that, but I just wanted to say that. And I also wanted to say that um, people that we think of often, those of us in this room anyway, think of as political poets like Pablo Neruda, weren't always political poets. And at a certain point, like Eric talked about, at a certain point in their development, the objective world around them hit them in the head and said, I got to stop writing what I was writing before and write something else. He actually wrote a poem about this, which he in interrogates the people who expect him to write about lilacs and pretty flowers. And so I can't do that anymore. There's blood running in the streets of Madrid. And so I, I think that, that the fight against fascism takes many forms, whether it's the fight for, uh, as Kathy pointed out really very well, the fight around, you know, the fight for, for mental health facilities, the fight for all kinds of things that we need daily. So I'm gonna shut up, thank you. Uh, I've, thank you. I've had second thoughts uh, um, recently. That was a three-year-old poem that I read to you. Uh, I, I, think, I think that we probably will get a little further beat, beating fascism by pointing out the positivity of people, people's needs, hopes and dreams. Right. We're missing, we're missing that. Like, I, you know, I can spit out a lot of crap about what's going on, but what, what do we have to offer? What do we have to offer? I think, I think, you know, people need things and nobody's asking them. I think we start, ought to start asking people. What do you think? Cool. Yeah. Especially people with labias. <laughs> people with labias rule they do they've got the answer um and and you know the thing is it's the, the responsibility of the poet the lyricist whatever to like make the connections um between things you know whether it's the ongoing genocide of native americans or the fact that you're told to look at what the police are doing to people of color and th and not believe your eyes but see it in another light there we're also here like like uh jennifer did with her with her poem that that had such humor to it right you're still making the connections you're bringing it together but but in a way that people laugh laugh and and i have a friend that calls that the ha ha hmm factor you know and I, I think that that's really important. And those like um, Mike and like Adam who just came to the call who are doing music, music and the lyrics for music are the, they're the heartbeat, right? They're, they're the things you remember and you sing to yourself so that, so that you keep remembering what you're about. And they're also what you use to like pump yourself up to keep that fight going or to comfort yourself when you're sad. The arts is and poetry are just so everything <laughs> to, to the revolution. They're, they're the almost kind of the blood in many ways, in my opinion. I think that's a good way for us to move on to the third section of the uh of the poetry reading. I, I wanted to find out, is, uh, is Tony Asante Lightfoot with us? 
can send her a text right now, Lou, to check in. How about that? That would be great if you could. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. I will. Thanks. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, okay. Well, um, let's start out the third segment with uh, Sarah Menifee. Hi, I'm, I'm very delighted to be part of this with wonderful um, chorus of voices, very uplifting. Um, so I'm just gonna bring up my poem here. Um, yeah, I'm of the, do a lot of wander out and see something, experience something and a poem comes. So that this is one of those. Uh, it's written over two days. I think you'll understand. Okay, where's my little cursor? Oh boy, computers. This is called Cake. When people got tired of shivering in the raw spring, they moved into the warmth of the cake we, are prom we were promised. And so it began. Little loaf cakes with butter icing. He had three stacked against his ragged chest, wending through the line, appealing madly to the blank-eyed shoppers that one might purchase them for him. I'm hard of hearing, said a hard-eyed older man to the hungry guy here in the Trader Joe's at Fourth and Mar at Market and Fourth. They approached, they appropriated the cakes and escorted him out. Do not let them eat cake they can't pay for. I had written the part above about injuring the cake the day before I witnessed that. That, 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 that. Thank you. Wow. wow. I want to say that Sarah's work is so amazing. Has spent, uh, Sarah, you spent so many years working uh, among the homeless, with the homeless. Uh, My friends. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And giving their vo giving voice to them. So I, I think the work that you do is just amazing. And eavesdropping on their voices because they do have voices. So, you know. Well, I know that you were very yeah. close to being homeless yourself. On, on numerous yeah, numbers. long ago. You get yeah. a taste of it, you understand. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's a I, powerful movement right now, really. Thank right. You. I want to go back to Jerry and see what the Jerry is. Uh, uh, well, I don't think he's going to be able, he can see and hear us, but I don't think he can speak into the phone. Really? Like, yeah. That is a shame. That's really a shame. Uh, thanks for finding that out for us. Um, um uh, the next readers that we have scheduled are not uh ready yet so we're going to go down to mike puikin and ask mike to step to the microphone mike to step to the mic mike right, thanks lou uh Thanks, uh, Daniel, Jack, and Lou for putting this on. It's really been terrific. The work has been just, just uh, inspiring. Uh, I'm Mike Puikin. My pronouns are he, his, and him. Um, uh, along with being part of the Guild Complex, along with Lou and Andrea Change, I also teach poetry in prisons. Uh, I teach it, I have taught it until COVID and hope to start up again soon at the um, federal uh, um, prison in downtown Chicago. And I also teach uh, recently released um, prisoners uh, at St. Leonard's, uh, at St. Leonard's uh, halfway house, uh, also in Chicago. Uh, my poem's about democracy, and I think we're all in favor of democracy, but as we also know, democracy is not enough. There have to be mechanisms in order to take care of the minorities, as this country has shown that it has not over many, over the entire length of uh, its existence. Um, 
This poem starts with a uh, epigraph by James Bovard. It says, democracy must be something more than two wolves and a sheep voting on what to have for dinner. This is called, democracy has lifted its voice. <clears throat> democracy has lifted its voice and boarded its windows. Democracy has entered the room, all rise. Democracy is a bag of M&Ms without the blue ones. Democracy stands outside your window singing sweet songs of love. Democracy has chops. It dances at bars, has too many Manhattans, tells you it loves you, tails you through department stores, through the iron gates of its asylums. Democracy, your assembly halls are filled with tears. Chamber of dicks. Holy are the poor, but let's table that for another meeting. Democracy needs to defend itself against other democracies. Mexican democracies, Philippine democracies, Beninan and Botswanian democracies. Not to mention those pesky local democracies with stockpiles of semi-automatic weapons and homemade baked goods. Democracy, democracy stands outside your door, blowing leaves off your lawn. So tell me, how do we settle this argument? Thanks. Especially appropriate considering the last few elections and the struggle in Georgia and the fact that there are 47 states, I believe, in the country right now that had voter suppression laws being uh, <clears throat> argued in the legislatures, including Illinois. So just something to, to think about for sure. Um, next, I'd like to call on Wardell Montgomery. You will need to unmute yourself, Wardell. How's that? There you go. Loud and clear. Okay. Great. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be a part of this forum and uh, to kind of reflect on what, what we're saying and what's going on. So I really do appreciate it. And I'm getting a feeling how many other things that we do can be anti-fascist. It doesn't have to be pointed out directly, but I guess if you just want to be fair about what's going on and how people should be treated, I guess that's anti-fascism. So uh, the poem I'd like to share with you uh, is called uh, Sweet Beautiful Monster. In parentheses, the sexy side of war, satire expose. And now, Look at you, my sweet, beautiful monster. I wanted you to stay home with your mom and me and help raise your son. You could have gone to junior college and learned a good trade or business skill. That general said you would make a good soldier. They were looking for a few good men and women. The cultures of war love the sweet smelling sounds of sex, booze and drugs. The general said it was a just war for democracy with a little collateral damage. He would personally recommend you to be the poster child for Uncle Sam. You have sex appeal, that Jenison crime. You cannot resist serving your country. It's the sweet scientific thing to do. Your mom and I did not want you to go. For a long time, we've been protesting bad wars for good reasons. We lost friends and relatives you know how much we were hurt. We believe in blaming the country and not the soldiers for going to war, but we taught you the art of war facts. You read the articles, books, and you saw the videos. To poke fun at us, you protested our pro protest with your big sign reading, war is beautiful. It creates jobs. It controls the population. You said there's a certain erotic, beastly, beautiful thing about war, rape, fires, hangings, domestic violence, and sadomasochism. It's better than belonging to a gang and doing drugs and crime. 
Don't ask. We won't tell. It's better belonging to a gang than doing drugs. My kids said ugly is the new beauty and violence is the new rich. Your mom and I both agreed that you should get some counseling, ASAP. The next day you saw the general and joined the army because you were bored and broke. It was all the wild drug sex life you expected and more than you had bargained for. A sweet, beautiful, horrible experience and you loved every minute of it, especially the friendly fire until they sent you home to the psych ward laughing out of your head about what a great time you had being a sex tool for imperialism. After all, like the straight talk in general, you were just following orders for the slapstick theater of war and my sweet, beautiful monster. When your baby looks at you confused and crying because he does not even recognize his own mother, not like the before picture, Martin said, Martin was against the Vietnam War. And Malcolm said, we were lied to, hooked, winked, and bamboozled. The general argued against the war privately, but supported publicly. He follows orders. He also said he would take the fifth after drinking it first. And he was famous for saying, never air the dirty linen of your war, fascist fantasies, wet dreams, say the masochistic but not your between you, Uncle Sam, and the Taliban that went insanely crazy bad, tossed you to the streets with the bottles and cans you picked up to earn a buck to buy some boots to share a drink in your free public housing home under the bridge where you're not even counted among the unemployed. It does not matter because war is so freaky. Sexist and sexy. Don't ask my savvy sugar horny honey bun, and we won't tell. Whoa. <clears throat> All right. That's tremendous. Um, Thank you. Now, um, <laughs> I am. Trying to patch in. Well, let's see. Hesu, have you gotten that video yet? Not yet. I'm still waiting for it. But waiting. I see Adam is on. I don't know if um he wants. He was on earlier. Yeah. Um, I have been texting him, but not getting any answers from him. Okay. Um. And <clears throat> I wanted to know: Is Billy Tuggle here yet? So I haven't seen him come in. Apparently not. Um, Lou, who's left? We have the two poets from uh, the Homeless Union. And we have Billy Tuggle. Okay. Um, and what what Adam is showing us, you can see a little bit on the screen of a talent show, which is going on in Uptown right now, of uh, a meet and greet among homeless people uh, and people in the community who are the homeless folks are resisting being evicted from their their tents where they are encamped underneath the viaduct of the Wilson uh, train station here in, in, uh, in Chicago. Um, I guess the, the you, you can see a little bit of the performance going on, but it is not unmuted. So I'm, I'm not sure, Adam, are you available? I suspect not. Um, well, I think at this point, what I would like to do, since since uh, <clears throat> we're I, we can buy a little bit of time, uh, Daniel, would you like to read something? Since we we had talked about a plan B in case we couldn't get some of the readers in, so I'm going to ask Daniel to share something with us. Yeah, absolutely, Lou. Um... Thank you so much. Um, and um, Wardell, thank you for 
sharing your work with us, man. That was such a powerful, powerful poem. Um, my name is Daniel. Uh, I'm also a poet. I'm also a teacher. I've uh, been with the league now for about a year. Um, and I think one thing that Eric uh, said that was really profound is, is how, uh, you know, these objective conditions kind of come into fruition and you almost have no choice but to use your voice or to speak out. Um, and uh, this poem that I have, this piece that I had, I wrote recently, there is no title, so it's just untitled. Um, I didn't realize how close Earth Day was, so it kind of coincides with that as well. Um, so, a sick planet breathes through straws, yet still beautiful and full of life. Flower petals sprinkle about the ground, skies remain blue despite blood-stained hands, the carbon footprint of the ruling establishment. Earth will restore itself with or without them, billions of years of existence towering over mere thousands. It didn't take very long to drain its treasures and it's never too late to restore them, to spit upon the ambition to rule everything, to visualize and build a better world, to preserve life by all means. Mm -hmm. All right, talk about vision, right? Um, is there anything from Tony yet? Not yet. I'll let you know when uh, it's up. I think um, she's have, she's a. Uh, it's probably a large file, so we'll see. Okay. Um, maybe what we do before we we hear from Tony then is uh, let's see whether there are any comments that folks have in terms of these questions. Uh, how is art the soul of revolution? We were getting into a little of that in the last round, but anybody who would like to just kind of jump in on that question, how is art the soul of revolution? What do you think, uh, Karen? i put you on the spot. You're on mute. There you go. Okay, well, how is art the soul? Well, we, you know, poetry, art, it's, it's a, different, a different language that kind of speaks in our souls. It reaches people in a way that um, other forms of communication, I think, don't touch. And when you're when you're trying to change things and you're trying to make a change, you have to use every language, every communication that you you can to reach people. And and it's it's also a common language. I mean, everybody, everybody across the planet has their forms of art, their forms of poetry and song. So um I I that's all I would say is that uh it's a different, it's a different language and it's a, a different way of reaching people. Yeah. No. <laughs> the poetry is the most powerful weapon in terms of bringing people together everywhere. It's not considered such but in, it is in fact objectively the most powerful weapon in the world. That's why of course, there's no money associated with it always, or if it is, it's by accident. It's the poorest art. <laughs> it's the poorest art and it's the most powerful art it's the one that literally belongs to everyone. Everyone lives poetically within him or herself. That fact is the one fact I'd like you all to consider, not merely yourself in relation to your own ego as a writer, or et cetera, 
But think of it possibility that everyone actually lives within him or herself as a poet, not yet fully able to express himself or herself that way, but objectively lives that way in his or herself inner life. And then you'll see what I'm saying is true, that it's actually potentially, objectively, the most powerful weapon in the world. On, uh, on the plan B level, um, I know Hesu is going to let me know when, when Tony's video is available. What's happening is that Tony is uh, emailing Hesu, hopefully, uh, a video of uh, performance, and she's very powerful. So I'm really hoping that that will come through quickly. Um, and we'll be able to, to put that on live, as it were. Um, I'm going to take the the prerogative of the of the um, of chairing this section and uh, just to fill in some space with a piece that I wrote a, a few years ago. Um, it's called "Ode to a Spinal Cord." might not sound like it's uh, appropriate to this occasion, but it is. Behold the circuit running in a conduit, careful, braided, intertwined sets of neurons leading from the stem of the brain, sheathed in a cover, a skin called a nurturing mother, a pia mater, enveloped in bone casing, bones that articulate where they meet, so that they bend and offer crevices, foramina, through which nerves creeping, encircling, ivy tendrils emerge at different levels. Signals fly along the pathways to muscles of the rib cage to augment breathing, to femoral muscles, to initiate a kick to the biceps. So the arm reaches down to allow the hands to message the fingers to cradle a sleeping baby, death to the Nazi class who severed Freddie Gray's spinal cord. Um, and let's see, we still haven't gotten word from Adam. Anybody else want to talk about the, uh, about their Im impressions about, uh, the role of art and the revolution. Uh, let, let me say one thing. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, uh, you know, there, it, it's been very eloquently talked about uh, today in many different ways. I, I am, uh, I, there is a, a quote that uh, Wallace Stevens had when, made when talking about fascism. He said, the violence within protects us from the violence without. What he meant by that is the violence within is the violence of our imaginations, the ability to push beyond restrictions, to go anywhere. Um, and as we know, fascism is about control. It's about holding the, the status quo and controlling it. And so uh, imagination is the way, is one way in which we uh, subvert that. Um, and I feel that that is one of the strengths of poetry. And it is uh, one of the strengths, of course, of art. And so uh, along with all the reasons that have been talked about today, that I'd like to throw that out as also one of the ways that art contributes uh, to the struggle. I'm new to the group. Can you hear me? 
Yeah, go ahead, David. I'm uh, I'm new to the group and appreciate your efforts in the poetry. And I'm just thinking I, I've done music in one way or the other all my life. And uh, music does two things along with, the, with more than mother and the other arts, I think, which is one, it, it's expressive as the other arts are. Poetry are and art is and it's imaginative. And every totalitarian regime that I know of has done very much to suppress art that is foreign to its own concept. Art is imaginative and it's breaking free. Another thing that arts do is bring people together like in this group. And I think that expression and, and expression that joins people together is, is liberating in and of itself. And that is something that's intrinsic to the arts. That's it. I am I'm now going to, uh, I think, because we, we're not able to get the people that we wanted at this point in, in this uh, program, uh, I think what we should do is um, to respect everybody's time is to close out the program. And I'm going to ask Daniel to say a few words and then uh, Mike Felton will close out the program with another um, musical offering. Um, I, I want to make sure that everybody who has uh, items that they want us to connect with, like, for example, if you have a book or a CD or something you want us to, to know about, put that in the chat and I will send that to everybody who's been on the, uh, on, on this, uh, uh, Zoom link. Um, so, uh, hey, Lou? yes. Ken. Lou? Yes. Uh, I have a very, very short little tune I could do about uh, a subject which is painfully dear to my heart. It's uh, not exactly against fascism, but it is about the southern border of this country. And if you like, I could pull that off really quickly. I think I'd be I'd be open to that uh, Dan. because because I know who you are and I know you're going to to uh, give everybody uh, an enjoyable. Our country, which was never fair, has now become a child's nightmare. Like those dreams that leave us shaken, they're ones from which he can not awaken. He opens his eyes from sleep to see that he's still not with his family. He's four years old, calls for his poppy. That little voice, poppy, poppy. Oh, now he's locked in a room full of strangers. Much fear he feels how far he's traveled. But if we show him mercy, they say, there'll be terrible legal dangers and democracy will get unraveled. Oh, land of the free and the home of the brave. Well, it seems like the brave are mighty few. Oh, I don't know how this all seems to you. Tormenting a child's not a brave thing to do. Thank you so much, Ken. Well, thank you for letting me have a shot at it. Oh, no problem at all. This, this has been such a great, great event, such an awesome space uh, to share work and, and to share thoughts. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here um, and being uh, a part of such an awesome event. Thank you to everyone for being here with us. I'm, uh, I'm absolutely blown away by the discussion, the analysis and the work that's been presented today. Uh, big shout out to, to Jack and Luis and all of the poets. Uh, my co-moderator Lou, 
tech folks, participants, and anyone that attended and was a part of this effort. Um, as it's been mentioned, uh, poetry can be used to envision a better world. Um, it is a vehicle, it's a lens to view and assess the current conditions, as well as a blueprint to create new conditions. Um, and art should not be dictated by the market or pro uh, profit motives. It doesn't belong to the state. Um, it, it belongs to people and it should be used to free us all. Um, it's empowering and inspiration to know that there's so many cultural workers out there, including those in our presence today that are working to raise the consciousness of people far and wide. Um, and in addition to that, I'll speak a, a little bit about the league and kind of who we are. Um, uh, the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, AKA LERNA. So who are we? Uh, we are members of the working class coming from an assortment of backgrounds and experiences. Uh, we are social, political and class conscious individuals working to elevate the consciousness of our class and to influence the struggle for change uh, as well as the transformation to a cooperative society. Uh, a society that must be based on the public ownership of the necessities of life and the distribution of goods according to need. Uh, our mission is to connect with and to unite the scattered freedom fighters and, and, and the demands of a growing class of workers um, that are demanding food, quality health care, and, uh, and education, as well as housing. A growing class of workers that can no longer survive in a system of corporate private property and endless oppression. Uh, we use study and analysis as our tools. We use education as our weapon to mobilize and engage in the battle of ideas. We struggle in real time, in the streets, in workplaces, and everywhere else we are. The Rally Comrades publication and website uh, provides up-to-date articles, statements, and analysis of, of the key questions and events uh, of importance to the people. We encourage you to check us out and subscribe to the Rally Comrades at rallycomrades.org. Uh, we invite you to join us in the struggle for change. To be a member is to accept the program, unite around the fight for basic needs, study and learn from one another, and realize a vision to secure the future of humanity and our planet. You can contact us at lrna.org, learner.org, and the Learner Chicago Facebook page. Thank you all once again for coming today. Thank you to all the poets for sharing your work and giving us your time. We appreciate you all, uh, much love, and the future is up to us and the masses of the people. Thank you so much, y'all. I guess I'm up. <laughs> yeah, I am. No. Well, uh, I'm sorry. I was I was totally <laughs> totally fooled there, uh, mouthing away. I, I want to encourage everybody to put in the chat their you know anything they want us to know. We'll circulate it. We're now going to close out with Mike Felton uh, from a, a, a song from his CD uh, Diamonds and Televisions. So, go ahead, Mike. Okay, a couple of years ago. Uh, in conclusion, I'd just like to say, uh, you know, I, I've been thinking about Utah Phillips, and some of you might know who he is, and some of you might not. But uh, uh, he once told me that the most revolutionary act uh, you can do is to create, to create and utilize. Uh, uh, write your own song, write your own poem, and put that out there. And I, I was thinking that uh, if you get to see a copy of the Declaration of Independence, it has folds in it because it had to be moved. And uh, that's what you can do with poetry. That's what you can do with this uh, song I'm going to do and uh, just take it to the people and uh, not wait for the people to come to you. So uh, this little song is uh, kind of about my family. We talked about borders a little bit uh, while well, we had a lot of borders, but uh, I found out I had a great grandfather that came from Ireland and had an illegitimate child, which turned out to be my grandmother. And then went to uh, uh, find out a little bit about him and wrote this song. It's called It All Ends Here, but it, not only It All Ends Here, but it begins here too, so. Come from Ireland to drive that mule. 
Cause you're getting rich. Drink your whiskey, call him a son of a bitch. But it all ends here. It all ends now, now, now. This is my shovel. This is my fly, fly, fly. Dig me a hole. This further down, down, down. This is my shovel. This is my fly. from Ireland to drive that mule. Pretty soon the mule drove him to. Gave his heart to grandma's soul of mine. Pretty soon he's working overtime. But it all ends here. All in now, 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 just my shovel, just my plow, 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 dig me a hole, a little further down, 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 just my shovel, just my plow. There you go. Right. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to everybody who is here. Thanks Thank you. All the poets. Thanks to all the performers. Thanks to everybody who listened in. Thanks to everybody who wanted to say something but didn't. <laughs> Thanks to all the artists. Um, and we'll, we will definitely do something like this again. Uh, don't know when, but you're on our mailing list now and you will be getting <laughs> notifications. So again, thank you. thank you all for being thank here. you. Thank you, Lou. You're welcome. Detroit says thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I think Jack and Felipe, that was amazing. Okay, we can uh, we can stop live streaming now, right? <laughs> yes, and you know what? I was so pissed I forgot to record um, your intro, but I caught a mic song right at the very beginning and the rest of the program. So we'll be posting that on YouTube as well. Cool. Fantastic. All right. Take care. Thanks. Thank Thanks, you. folks. Appreciate everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so Bye, much. Everybody. It was great. Thank Jennifer, you. that's great. Thank you. See you yeah, soon. Everybody, everybody, everybody from Chicago, be aware of the fact that there will undoubtedly be another 100,000 Poets for Change event in September that Jennifer will be curating. <laughs> 
Wait, 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 wait to put the pressure on, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. Bye, guys. See you soon. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you. There's a place in Chicago where you don't want to go, where the good Lord forget about you. The devil never calls. State attorney says it's not there. Mayor said no, no, no. Down at Holman Avenue. I ain't told you so.